Hello, everybody. This is uh, Dr. Josh Smith, and I am here with uh, tonight's webinar, How to Talk to Someone Who Wants to Attempt Suicide. Um, I started doing these Facebook Live videos um, last month for Autism Awareness Month. And hello, Eli, how are you doing today? Yeah. Are you feeling happy? Yes. Do you have anything that you would like to say to Facebook Nation? That's quite the face. Uh, any? What were your thoughts on Avengers Infinity Wars? All right. Good night. Um, so we did, uh, my wife and I did the autism uh, videos uh, for Autism Awareness Month um, last month, and then someone made a very brilliant suggestion, in my opinion, one of my friends, that uh, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and that we could continue this going and talk about suicide, which is a subject that I am familiar with as well. Now, uh, in uh, discussing this issue, I felt like we need to go over a little bit of uh, background. Uh, first, I'll tell you my professional qualifications. Hey, Jimmy, how's it going? Um, I want to talk a little bit about my professional qualifications to talk about suicide. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in psychology from Utah State University, a master's degree in clinical psychology from Spalding University, and a um, um, doctorate degree in clinical psychology from Spalding University. I did uh, my internship at Jewish Family Services. I have done practicums in a lot of different places, the VA, Life Spring Crisis Center, Centerstone, to name a few. Um, and I am current, oh, I've also worked at Our Lady of Peace Hospital and the great Kentucky prison system. And, um, I am currently a, uh, have my own private practice uh, where I primarily, primarily specialize in, in autism, but yet still suicide comes down the track every now and then. And I will tell you, despite working in a lot of different various settings, uh, suicide has its way of showing up wherever you're at. Um, as with the other videos that I've done, feel free to share this video um, with all those that you feel like this information will be helpful for. Uh, also, uh, tomorrow morning, I will have this uh, video transferred uh, into YouTube for format and uh, on my YouTube channel, because I know that's easier for some people to access it that way. Um, so, my experiences with suicide are not limited to purely professional matters. Um, in fact, um, one of the main reasons why I'm doing uh, any of these webinars is to raise money for the Out of Darkness Walk. Now, I would encourage anyone who hasn't done that to do it because it is a very special experience. Um, and this is an organization, uh, one of the things I like about this organization is it raises money for suicide intervention, not just awareness. We're all pretty dang aware about suicide. Let's do something about it. And that, I completely agree uh, with this uh, point of view. And they have done a lot of good research and established a lot of great interventions to help um, combat suicide. Um, we're, uh, these videos are being sponsored by my mother who walks in the suicide walk every year. My mother has lost two children to suicide, two of her four children. The link to donate, um, uh, uh, to the out of darkness walk for my mother is included with this video. And if any of you all, if any of you find this helpful in any way, if you could please make a donation, I know uh, my mother would sure appreciate it. It's really hard 
uh, for my mom to go through Mother's Day having to remember that two of her children committed suicide. So I want to talk a little bit about my brothers here for a minute. Um, my brother Jared committed suicide 16 years ago, approximately. And, uh, and I have to say, it is one of the most uh, brilliant suicide plans I've ever seen. Uh, Jared had informed everyone that he was going to be serving a Mormon mission. And um, those last for two years. In fact, he had received an assignment to serve a mission in Arizona and had obtained his information, his plane ticket to travel to Utah where he would study to be a missionary for three weeks and then go from Utah to Arizona uh, for the remaining 23 months uh, to serve as a missionary. What this allowed him to do was to say goodbye to everybody and they think that he was saying goodbye um, for two years, but in fact, he was saying goodbye for his time here on earth. And um, he gave, in fact, real, no, no real cl clues to anyone. And on the day that he was supposed to fly out, that morning before anyone woke up, he went to the baseball field where we used to play baseball, and he shot himself in the head. Um, and that has had a significant negative impact on my, on me and my family, and his friends, of course. Um, my brother Jacob committed uh, suicide approximately three years ago. It was a spontaneous act. Uh, it was not planned, and it was um, it really caught us um, uh, um, off guard. Um, it was um, it was also with a gun, um, and I will tell you, uh, Suicide, one of the many, many frustrating things about suicide is that it's preventable. It's the seventh leading cause of death, and we can stop it. Um, so in having these discussions, we're going to talk about some things that are pretty serious. Uh, and in order to overcome this problem, we're going to have to have some mature discussions, and that's fine. Um, mature discussions are often necessary in order for us to overcome problems that we're dealing with. Um, now, one of the things that I think is also important to understand um, is that Emily really should answer her phone. <laughs> and two, uh, the, uh, I think it's important that you all know uh, that I have previously attempted suicide. I um, started having suicidal thoughts when I was uh, 15 years old. And um, now I'm going to tell you something. This is going to be hard to believe, uh, but it is true. I was a geek in high school. I know you look and you see this intelligent, charismatic um rival to Dr. Strange, and you think, how could this man be a geek? But yes, in fact, I was a geek in high school and um, was often bullied in a way um, uh, that is often hard to comprehend uh, in, a, in a very inhumane way. Um, I remember the first day I had my first suicidal thought. Um, a young lady uh, was in the cafeteria at Jeff High and uh, brilliant Jeff High strategy of having 2,500 students and 300 seats in the cafeteria. And um, so you had to be really popular to get one of those seats. 
But anyway, I was going in there uh, to get my uh, food, and then one of the popular girls threw a piece of cake at me. And of course, hit me right here, frosting side to the cheek, and it kind of fell down um, as it hit the floor. And the girls laughed, and the girl who threw the cake said, if I was such a geek, I would just do the world a favor and kill myself. And I remember uh, just, I wasn't going to give her the pleasure to see me cry. But I went upstairs, I went upstairs to the second floor, I kind of snuck up there. And I remember thinking, I just want to jump off this staircase. I should kill myself. And one of the reasons I didn't is I thought, well, two floors ain't going to cut it. Uh, I never told anybody how I felt. And, and, the, and I want to, and the reason why I'm telling you some of these things is to understand how you do talk to somebody who you feel wants to attempt suicide or who has told you so as much. We have to get over this stigma related to mental health. I don't understand. Uh, we live in a world where many different things can break down in our bodies. We can have problems with our kidneys. We can have problems with our lungs. We can be born with webbed toes. We can be born with six fingers. And that's a special problem because then you really uh, – you made some bad decisions if you were a six fingered man. And so why are we not thinking that um, your brain can have some problems with it? I don't know. It's the most complicated thing ever created. So that can have some problems with it too. I, I never told anybody I was having suicidal thoughts because I thought I was going to be locked away. And I thought I wasn't going to be able to achieve the dreams that I had for myself. And um, I wasn't going to allow that to happen. So I didn't tell anyone. And um, I started having suicidal thoughts on a daily basis. Uh, for people who have suicidal thoughts for that long, they start to uh, think about what method they would prefer. Also, what method they have access to. And the method that sounded the best to me was to jump off this Second Street Bridge. Uh, and that would be the method that I would think about. That would be what would come to my mind. That would be what I would plan for, how I would get there, when I would go, and things like that. Let's talk about another thing that people don't understand about suicide. A person who is having suicidal thoughts is not every minute of every day of their life planning on uh, how they're going to commit suicide. Suicidality comes in waves. So I may go through a day where I have a suicidal thought and I might think about it for a couple of minutes. And it, my overall uh, motivation to commit suicide might only be 10% that day. But there might be other days where I've had a really bad day or the thoughts are coming and they're coming intense. And my uh, motivation might be closer to 80, 90%. And, uh, and it can vary by the day. And, um, and many times the individual experiencing those thoughts does not understand that. One of the things that I did not understand um, is that um, just because I was having suicidal thoughts doesn't necessarily mean that I was going to be going to the hospital. First of all, do you know how many times a day I get told that by a client that they're having suicidal thoughts. It depends on where I'm working. But uh, let's, at the prison, that was a frequent, you know, two or three times before lunch kind of experience. 
uh, when I was uh, working for uh, LifeSpring, at least three or four serious uh, encounters a day where I was having to make the call whether the person goes to the hospital or not. Another thing I didn't understand, if you have to go to a psych hospital, you are not going to spend the rest of your life there. You're going to more than likely spend five to seven days. Now, it's stressful. It's not great. I mean, singing La, La Vida Loca on the Louisville Psych Ward karaoke machine, that is fun. Not worth the price of admission, but fun. Uh, however, um, it is not going to a psych hospital has one big advantage, and that is it keeps you safe. That I have this goal for every client that I work with that they never have to go to the hospital. I don't want them to go there. The food's horrible. But the one thing that it does is it keeps you safe because it prevents access to means and opportunities to hurt yourself. And if you have to go to the hospital for five to seven days, life will go on. Okay. I continued having suicidal thoughts, even though I had some really good experiences in my life. Um, I served a Mormon mission in the country of Chile. Uh, in a very rural or uh, area of Chile, Chile, in the Concepcion, Chile area, and I would have suicidal thoughts every day of my mission, even though I was in a very good spiritual place. I was having fun. The suicidal thoughts just came. And so let's talk about another misconception. Uh, sometimes people, Sometimes people think that when someone is having um, suicidal thoughts, that something bad happened. Not necessarily. It's the brain is predisposed towards negative thinking. And so sometimes, and this would be very uh, frustrating, I would be having a good day and then a suicidal thought, suicide thought would pop up. And uh, that was very annoying. All right, this comes from a good friend of mine, Gabe King. Do you find that one of the uh, the problems with people not coming out about this is, uh, or having problems talking about it is due to religious beliefs? Yeah, Gabe, that probably does play a significant role. Um, and uh, I will say religions are really coming on board on this. This actually, good question, Gabe, because it ties into a time uh, when I was uh, on uh, my mission in Chile. And one of the things about where I was at is it rained all the time. It rained third, it, one out of th three days in Chile, it rained. And I mean like all day rain. And so it was like nine o'clock. It was dark. It rained all day. And um, we got to this lady's house and knocked the door. And uh, she she let us in and we start talking. And uh, uh, the lady said, Akayete, which means shut up. So, you know, if you don't want to say shut up in front of your children, you can always say Kayete and then you don't get in as much trouble. And, <laughs> and then she said, I only have one question. My son committed suicide a year ago, and at his funeral, the priest said, uh, this young man is dead, and that's a tragedy, but the real tragedy is that he uh, committed suicide, and he's now in hell. So, uh, brethren, because that's what they called us. They called us brothers. Brethren, I have one question for you. Is my son in hell? It's a tough question. But... I believe most religions are coming are coming to the understanding that uh, judgment will be determined based off physical and mental health. And I really have found that many people have found peace in that understanding. 
Um, I continued to have suicidal thoughts after my mission, after marrying a wonderful woman. Uh, and uh, despite having many good things happen, um, but it gradually got worse while I was on my internship in Virginia. This happened for a number of reasons. By that time, I had three children, two of whom were autistic. Uh, their behaviors were often severe, uh, very stressful. We were away from all family and didn't have as much support as uh, we were used to. Uh, I was on my internship, and that was difficult. I was having problems completing my dissertation, and that was difficult. Um, and um, my suicidal thinking gradually got worse. Uh, gradually got worse. And um, so this brings us to the next thing I want to talk about. So there's different level of suicidal thinking. 50% uh, of the American population has had a suicidal thought at least once in their life. Now, for many people, it reaches only the first category, which is what we call passive suicidality. And the most common example of this is somebody thinking, I just want to go to sleep and I don't want to wake up. They don't want to do anything active to um, bring about the, the matter, but they, uh, they don't want to keep going either. And thoughts along those lines are the most common. As those continue in intensity, we get into active suicidal thinking, where we start thinking about how and when. We get a little more troubling then. Now, another thing that we always look at when we're looking at someone who is having suicidal thoughts is what we call protective factors. These are the things um, that would make a, make a person less likely to follow through on their thoughts. And they can be anything. I have used anything that I can to my advantage. Uh, uh, family, wife, children, parents uh, are very common. Religious beliefs are common. Um, goals is one that I've used in the past. There was this one man who had no living family members, and I said, uh, one of the questions I will uh, often ask an individual is, well, what keeps you from committing suicide? And he said, well, I love my dog. Who, who's going to feed my dog? And I, went, and I ran with it. Oh, that's a good point. Who's, somebody's got to feed the dog. We just need that dog to live forever. But, yes, yeah, somebody needs to feed that dog. Um, then the next step up in the intensity is when they come up with a plan. And I will tell you, as a mental health practitioner, once they have a plan, we're going to take it pretty seriously. Uh, and there is going to be a, what we call a suicide assessment done by a mental health provider to see whether hospitalization is necessary. The plan consists of when, uh, where, and how, and they are and they, they have specifics on what they uh, are going to do. Okay, so we got Gabe here. Um, I've heard that one tell is that when the person who might commit suicide starts doing things out of character, like giving valuables away. Yep, that's a big one. Uh, you start seeing things like that. Uh, and um, they, they'll, one of the things that is, this is actually... When you first hear it, it's going to sound a little counterintuitive. Uh, but once some, somebody has a suicide plan, they tend to be a little happier. And, or they appear happier. And, that, and the reason is they see an end to the pain. Uh, you know, one of the things that I had the privilege of seeing while I was at the VA um, 
I had this one uh, man that I treated, um, and he had stepped on a mine while he was holding his radio in his right hand, and his hand blew off from the elbow down. And he had what was called uh, he had what's called phantom limb syndrome, where he felt like he was still holding that radio and he could never relax the muscles to let it go. And people who experience this, uh, it, it's my understanding of hell. Uh, and there's just nothing that can be done, no strategies, no medicine, except for this one thing that works sometimes. And I got to see it be done on the man. And that is, it was actually, it's well documented. You can see it in this great YouTube clip because it was done in a house episode where they put his uh, undamaged arm in a box with uh, a mirror in between in the two boxes so that when he puts the stump in the box, it looks like he has uh, two arms fully complete and you have the person relax the one arm. So it look, I mean, um, put a fist in the one hand so that through the mirror, it looks like he's putting a fist in the other hand and then have him relax the hand and then the reflection makes it looks like he relaxed the other hand. And I have to say, you should have seen that man's face, tears bawling, because that was the first time in over 30 years that he had felt a relief from pain. But I had, uh, had a suicidal thought every day of my life from... Uh, the age of 15 to the age of 32. So the idea of relief from suffering sounded amazing to me. Sounded like something to look forward to. Once uh, somebody has their plan, it is not uncommon for them to start doing rituals. So by this time that I had my plan, we had moved back to Indiana. I was uh, working this job I didn't particularly like. Uh, my dissertation had been thrown out and um, looking like I was going to have doctoral level debt uh, with a master's level education, that I wasn't going to be able to meet the needs of my family and that uh, I was going to have the really unfortunate cognition that my family would be better off without me. So I came up with my plan, which was to jump off the second street bridge. Once I went to rituals, I would drive to the bridge. I would go to where I thought I wanted to jump. I count my steps. I, uh, I, I, I was preparing myself to go. Now I will tell you, um, once you get, once you know of somebody doing rituals, they need to go to the hospital. It's not, it's not a question of um, when or where. They're going to the hospital, and they're going now. Uh, and, in fact, you are not going to leave that person out of your sight until they have been admitted into a psychiatric hospital. And... Um, and that's when, that's when you can take your eyes off of them, when they're at that stage. Uh, I had planned to kill myself on October 30th, 2010. Uh, and um, by the time I got to that point, I was completely emotionally numb. I walked up uh, that bridge, and as a person who has a somewhat fear of heights, had no fear. Um, I, I had done my best to give no clues to anybody about what was happening. And uh, I didn't want to be stopped. So I got to the point that I had planned on. I jumped. Uh, I did not give anybody time to talk me out of it or anything. And now I will tell you this. And, you know, this is just between us. And this isn't a scientific webinar, but um, 
and I know there's no scientific explanation for this, but I felt like I slowed down as I was falling. The scientist in me knows that that can't happen, but that's what I felt. And so the spiritual person in me believes that my brother Jared caught me and slowed my fall. Um, but, but that's what, like, like somebody grabbed me. I, uh, fell into the water. I don't recommend this because it hurt. I fell on this right side, um, and I broke eight ribs all on this side of my body. I came up out of the water and I'll tell you, it's a very strange sensation. I had planned on being dead and now I'm not. Uh, I was a very, in addition to that, October 30th, 2010 was a remarkably warm day uh, in Southern Indiana. The water could have been really cold. Um, and so I come up from the water and I don't know what to do next. And um, the, um, there, because it was a warm day, there was a boat out. And so the boat comes up to me and it was a, uh, three couples who were out enjoying the weather and they threw one a ring buoy at me and uh, I grab onto that. The ladies say, uh, well, reel him in, reel him in. And the guys are like, we can't reel him in. He's crazy. He just jumped off the bridge. And so one of the guys yells out, hey, why'd you jump off the bridge? And I yell back, because I was so happy with my life. And that was the first time that I felt like I was going to make it because uh, I had just done this th big thing and I was still me. My personality didn't go away. I was still that sarcastic little snot too smart for his own good. And that didn't change. I was admitted uh, uh, to U of L hospital. Um, and was prescribed some better medication. I did an intensive outpatient program at Our Lady of Peace, where, interestingly enough, and uh, a big shout out to all my former Our Lady of Peace employees who are out there. When I got done with my program, the lady from Human Resources met with me and said, Mr. Smith, we're aware of your qualifications and we normally don't do this but we would like to hire you to work on our uh, adolescent autistic unit. And so uh, one of the few people to make the transition from Our Lady of Peace patient to Our Lady of Peace employee. Uh, and it's definitely one of the reasons why when I worked there, I was so motivated to keep the children busy because um, it, is, um, it is boring in the psych hospital. I mean, just, entertainments at a minimum. Um, so let's talk about if someone tells you that they're having thoughts about hurting themselves. First thing, that is the best compliment that you are ever going to get in your life. Because out of all the people that they could tell, they trusted you with their deepest and darkest secret. They're your hero. And they uh, they view you as the one person they can trust. So uh, just know that they um, they have a lot of trust in you if they if they share that with you. Um, it's all it's humbling to have that much trust put in, in, in a person. It's, hum, it's been humbling for me when it's been presented to me. And because it's humbling, sometimes we can get overwhelmed. Uh, now, I am going to, to help. First of all, when this happens, you need to do a little method that I call the psychology two-step. Uh, it's not written in any book, but it, it, it's, it's how I remember it. The first step, validate the feeling. Second, express care and love. Okay. 
Somebody says to me, Josh, I've been feeling like I want to hurt myself. I am so sorry to hear that. I am so sorry that you feel that way. I love you. I am so sorry that you've been having those feelings. Validate the emotion, express love and concern. That Make sure you do that two-step first before you do anything else. Um, one of the things also is you might not need to say much. If you, if you do the two-step, what, what you will generally find is they start talking. If they are talking, listen. Do not say a word. Listen. Listen to it all. You have, uh, if they are talking and they're in this state, you have nowhere else you need to be. Whatever it is, you can be late. You're just going to listen. And um, as you as you listen, um, one of the things when you get to the point where you start talking is you do want to ask if they are going to a therapist or a psychologist. This is essential for a couple of different reasons. The, the therapist or psychologist is, has to make two big decisions. And um, one is, does the person need to be hospitalized? You as a person who is not their treating therapist, do not make the call for hospitalization. Even when I am consulting with my friends from church and I am not the therapist, I will not make the call that says they have to go to the hospital. It's not appropriate. But I do want to know if they are going to see a therapist. If they are not, you need to help make, ensure that they get in to see a therapist as quickly as possible. The other thing that uh, the therapist will evaluate is if the therapist needs to make a recommendation for medication. Now, I am a psychologist. I, my whole existence, the reason why my children have food to eat is that I believe that there are a lot of things that we can do without medication, but sometimes medication is necessary. So one of the things that I will do with my clients who are feeling suicidal is that I will uh, talk with the individual and make a recommendation about whether I feel like they need to follow up with either their general practitioner or their psychiatrist and be placed on psychotropic medication. <clears throat> what the one advantage for me, once my medication got right, I went from having suicidal thoughts every day uh, to only having suicidal thoughts like once a month. And that's, I got to tell you, I've been thinking so much better since that happened. Um, let's see, Ben, how do you know someone who is, how do you help someone who is not currently uh, seeking psych care to select one? Also, how to help because money often is a barrier to care. Okay. Excellent questions, Ben, and these vary a lot depending on the um, area of the country where you're at. Uh, now, most areas of the country have community mental health, uh, and if, if money is the barrier, community mental health is a good place to start. Now, another thing that um, I want, uh, want, you to, want you all to know is all these suicide crisis line numbers, they are great. But I'll tell you what another benefit of it. You can be the person helping the suicidal individual and you call for your friend and say, I've, I've been talking to my friend. They need to see a therapist. I don't know who to send them to. They will look up the information and find you a therapist and they will send you everything you need to know. And this goes for both the telephone uh, national line or the crisis text line. I will also tell you this organization, AFSP, 
that the Out of Darkness Walk raises money for. This organization that I am asking you all to donate to, this organization funded the establishment of the crisis text line. So even you as an individual, Ben, you can text this 741741 and say, I have a friend who lives in this city. They need to see a therapist. They are suicidal. They have a limited income. Uh, what income will, uh, what uh, agencies will provide therapy based off income? And then they will text you back a very thorough and accurate answer to your question. Um, so uh, also been uh, a number of uh, local universities will have graduate students who are being supervised uh, by uh, clinical psychologists. Spalding and U of L both do this practice where the graduate students who in most cases already have a master's degree uh, and are being supervised by doctoral level psychologists, there's the students who need the hours will provide the therapy for little to no charge. Um, and, um, and they still receive good quality care. Okay. So the, the, those are two big things that the therapist will, uh, will want to follow up on. When you are talking to someone who is having suicidal thoughts, and this is an important question and you want to, this is one where the wording is important and so th I'll, so to make that uh, distinction I'm going to just tell you the wording to use that way you don't have to worry about messing it up no offense uh, but uh, the wording is has there been anything going on lately that has made your situation worse so the reason why I say this is never ever never when someone says, I want to kill myself, do you say, why? Not a helpful question. Because for the most part, they don't know. And if they knew why, they wouldn't do it. So, but there are things that could be going on. Substance abuse, change in employment, uh, marital problems, all these things can be a contributing factor um, to whether or not the suicidal factors have gotten worse. And it is helpful to know that information. So the question is, has there any, has there been anything going on that has made this worse? And right, let's get to the next big elephant in the room. Have they told someone other than you? The research as done by AFSP has determined that if a person tells their tells their therapist that they are thinking about committing suicide, the probability of them committing suicide goes down 40%, which is great. Uh, however, if they a person tells a trusted family member that they are thinking about committing suicide, the probability of that person going committing suicide goes down 90%. 90 is bigger than 40. So we have to think at times, depending on the person and their situation, their age and their functioning, whether you are going to keep the information confidential. I, I realize what I just said, and I do not say it lightly. If a 16 year old person tells me that they are going to commit suicide tonight, and we have that conversation and I'm not feeling like it's going well or I'm not liking the, uh, what I'm hearing and they're not going to a therapist, they have not talked to a therapist and um, they are, um, um, they have told no one else and I'm, and I'm still concerned as we draw near to the end of the conversation, I will say, I will, I'm going to tell your parents. Uh, 
they and they will often say something back you can't do that now that is not true even as a, even if I, as a psychologist it, no matter who the person is they could be the most powerful person in the world uh, and they could be a grown adult very powerful individual and if they came to me under with the confidentiality of therapy and said Josh I'm going to kill myself tonight uh, and I and I uh, and I don't like how the conversation is going I'm going to say I'm going to call your wife and they say well you, you know this is confidential and I'm like eh. <laughs> because I actually have a duty to disclose when I believe that a person is an imminent risk to uh, themselves or others you as a friend are under no confidentiality pledge and so yes have I told something to somebody's parents that they told me in confidence and that they got ticked off at me yes that has happened uh, hey dad how's it going hope this hasn't been too stressful of a conversation I love you dad <laughs> uh, the uh, so uh, I'm going have I told people have I violated people's confidentiality and they got ticked out off at me yes and but in all cases I can tell you they got over it and in all cases I've never felt guilty about it if you don't remember anything about anything that we've talked about to this point remember this suicide survives in secrecy only by sharing information with the with the right person at the right time does this get better nothing gets better with secrets so I'm not saying post it on Facebook I'm not saying uh, yell it out in the streets I am saying if there is an influential family member that needs to know then that person needs to know um, I, I, I once uh, gave this presentation uh, to a ward and the bishop uh, kept saying well what can they do to get them to stop it so that the person doesn't have suicidal thoughts ever again and I will have to tell you I wish I knew I wish there was magic words that you could take suicide away even though I have received excellent therapy and are and I believe I'm on the appropriate medication for me I still have suicidal thoughts about once a month very annoying and I believe I probably am not going to keep having those until the resurrection uh, so do not put so much pressure that uh, you feel like you need to say something magical um, because I don't know what the magical thing to say is and I've been doing this a long time and as both and as a provider and as uh, somebody who's received the help there is nothing magical to say uh, just if all you do is tell them that you valid that you that what they feel is horrible and it's and you feel so bad that they have to go through it and that you love them and that you're there for them no matter what then they, how, the words you say and how you say them they'll all come out in the wash um, you uh, in for those of us in this area for those of us who are listening to this video you might know me you probably do you can definitely message me with questions when these things kind of things are going on as we continue uh, these webinars over the month of May uh, we're going to be doing more topics uh, next week we'll be talking about interventions for suicidal thinking uh, if you have questions between now and then please feel free to text me or message me on Facebook as always feel free to share this with whoever the important information the important thing is that this information gets out there also if you if you found found this webinar to be helpful please uh, donate to uh, the link 
that is listed on the page. Thank you all for listening, and I hope this has been helpful, and I'll see you next Wednesday.